Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this informational webinar as we prepare to the start of the 22-23 school year. We know this time of the year can be exciting and nerve-wracking for many families, so we hope that this session will provide you with some information to help you prepare, prepare for this upcoming school year. I am Dr. Admin Alexander, the Director of the Office of Family and Community Engagement, and I'm here with several panelists that will be sharing information as we get ready for, the, for, the, this, excuse me, for this upcoming school year. So let's meet our panelists. First, our Superintendent, Dr. Aaron Spence. Next, Dr. Caitlin Podati, Director of the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health. Mr. Uh, Matt Delaney, Chief Schools Officer. Ms. Danielle Colucci, Senior Executive Director of Elementary Schools. Uh, Mr. Jack Freeman, Chief Operations Officer. Mr. Tommy Demartini, Director of Security and Emergency Management. Mr. James Lash, Executive Director of Transportation and Fleet Management Services. And I would also like to introduce our ASL interpreters, Allison Yoder and Stacy Lowe. Thank you all for being here. Dr. Spence, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, and good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many people are joining us this evening for our back to school information webinar. And uh, we've got a great group of, of folks here, senior leadership in the division, and we've gotten some terrific questions. We're really looking forward to uh, answering those questions and being able to talk a little bit about what to expect in the coming weeks as we open up our new school year. I hope that everyone is really excited. I know I am. There has been a terrific energy over the last couple of weeks as we've been hearing from parents and students and as our teachers have come back to school and just know that we are ready for your children, our students to come back and join us across our city's 54 elementary schools. And we believe very strongly this is going to be our greatest year yet. And uh, we're looking forward to kicking that off by having this conversation tonight and the open houses that are coming up in the next few days for all of you. And so with that, Dr. Alexander, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to get us started with our questions. I think I was muted. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Uh, so we received many questions from our families to talk through tonight. And for ease, we have categorized our questions by subject to include health updates, safety updates, cell phone policy, transportation, and some general questions as well. The first subject on our list is health updates. And before we get to those questions, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bradati for a quick presentation. Dr. Bradati. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. Um, and I think I've got just a couple slides that we'll pull up to share with you this evening. So um, first, I just want to share as a pediatrician and as your public health director, I'm so happy to be with you this evening to talk through some important public health updates. So I want to share a little bit with you on three topics, and those are going to be COVID, they're going to be monkeypox, and a little bit on flu as well. So we can head to the next slide. So what you're seeing here is what we call the epidemic curve or epi curve of COVID virus activity recently here in Virginia Beach. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with these curves. You've seen them for all different places and all different ways over the past couple of years. And I'm sharing it with you now because it's important for us. It helps teach us about what's going on with virus activity lately. And what you can see here is that virus activity for COVID-19 over the past couple of weeks or so is actually starting to decrease a little bit, which is a really good thing. Now, what we've seen over the past two years with COVID-19 is that the virus activity can go up and it can go down. Increasingly, the epidemiologic pattern that we're seeing now is that it's settling into something similar to what we see with seasonal respiratory viruses. And that makes sense because of the way that COVID-19 moves from one person to the other, and those opportunities can increase when we're back together and indoors when the weather changes in the fall and winter. So what we might expect over the fall and winter is that this virus activity might again increase. And so first, what I want to highlight for you is it's really important to stay informed. And you can do that by talking with your public health and healthcare professionals and visiting our website to understand where virus activity is. 
The second thing I want to emphasize for you is that while we may see virus activity increase in the winter, the good news is we are not in the same place we were over the last couple of years. Um, we've got vaccines that work really well, and they're now available for everybody ages six months and older. So the second reminder I want to offer you tonight is if you haven't yet, it is not too late to get uh, boosted or get up to date on your COVID-19 vaccine. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, you'll probably start to hear public health talk about um, offering a new vaccine, so a, a bivalent vaccine that's going to be tailored a little bit to some of the strains that we've seen circulating more recently. So again, it is not too late to stay up to date and get that vaccine. And please stay informed about virus activity by reaching out to public health and healthcare professionals for any questions or concerns that you might have. We can head to the next slide. The next topic I wanna to cover for you tonight is a little bit about monkeypox, which I'm sure you're all hearing quite a lot about lately. So monkeypox is not a new illness or a new virus. Um, it's actually something that emerged initially decades ago um, in parts of Africa. We didn't see it a whole lot though. And when we did see it, it would appear similar to another virus in that same family um, that you've probably heard of, which is smallpox. So you get a lot of bumps, um, different kinds of pustules or rash all across the face and the body. So it didn't seem to happen very frequently um, and, and went away. And of course, thankfully, smallpox has been completely eradicated, so we don't see that anymore. But as I'm sure you're all aware, what's been happening over the last several months is what we call a, a re-emergence of monkeypox in a different way really around the world. So unfortunately, of course, we've seen cases emerge globally as well as in the US and in Virginia and here in Virginia Beach. Now, the good news about this virus is that we already know a little bit about it. We already have tools about it, uh, tools to treat it. So things like medications and vaccinations. So again, monkeypox belongs to that orthopox family of viruses and it can cause rash, fever, swollen lymph nodes. And the rash will look like some bumps or pustules on different parts of the body. Now, the way that this virus might move from one, one person to the next is really by close contact. So that can happen when we have close skin-to-skin -skin contact with somebody. Now, while they're not the same family, it's similar to what you might be familiar with if you grew up and had chicken pox. So again, a rash that moved from one person to the other by close contact um, and ultimately would crust over and then resolve. And that's what we see with monkeypox as well. And that's in fact what we're looking for when we follow up on cases, we're asking them how they're doing and waiting for that rash to crust over so that people are no longer considered infectious and can't spread it to other people. And that happens at different people for, for different people at different amounts of time. So what are we doing to prevent this spread of monkeypox? One of the really important things we do in public health that again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, especially now, is really case investigation and follow up with contacts who might be at risk. This is a, an approach and a tool that you've seen us use for COVID. We use it for all kinds of things, pertussis, all kinds of different illnesses, and monkeypox is the same way. So when a monkeypox case is identified, we talk to them to understand how the person is doing and any supports that they may need, but then to also understand any close contact, close skin-to-skin -skin contact they may have had so that we can reach out and offer those individuals vaccination. So there are two vaccines that are available to help prevent monkeypox, and we've been administering one of those, which is called the Genios here in Virginia. So that vaccine is a two-dose series that we offer to people who are at higher risk of getting monkeypox because they've had close contact. And the good news is that by offering that vaccine, we're often able to reduce the likelihood that somebody can get sick with monkeypox. So again, that surveillance, that investigation, and that vaccination are the important things that we do in public health to help minimize the spread of a virus like monkeypox. And we can head to the next slide. So I wanted to share just a little bit more for you about some of the things we're doing at the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health. So as I mentioned, following up on those cases to better understand any supports that they may need and to identify those people who are close contacts because those are our high risk individuals. 
We're gonna continue to provide vaccination. We've probably been doing about 200 to 300 doses a week, and we'll expand that as needed. We're gonna to continue to focus on outreach to people who are at higher risk. So remember the overall risk to our general community from monkeypox right now is actually low, but there are some people who are at higher risk, people who are those close contacts in particular, and those are the ones that we're reaching out to, and those are the groups that we're offering vaccine to. And of course, as always, it's gonna be really important to stay informed, right? So making sure that we're providing information, providing support um, and answering calls and inquiries for anybody who reaches out to us. And those are things we're gonna to continue to do, of course, for monkeypox or any other emerging type of public health concern. We can head to the next slide. So lastly, I wanted to talk very briefly about flu, um, which is very familiar to us all, but always an important thing to think about when we come to the fall and winter time. So influenza, of course, circulates every year, and there are some of us who can get very sick from flu, and very rarely there are some people who die because of flu. Now, again, the great news here is we've got a great preventive health tool and that is vaccine. Um, and so you'll start to see uh, places like your doctor's offices, pharmacies, and of course us at the health department start to offer flu vaccine as well. So please do consider uh, taking advantage of that preventive tool. It's gonna be another way to keep yourself and your families healthy this school season. And I think that concludes what I have for you today. We've got a couple of resources here. Um, again, you know, want to emphasize that while these are a couple of the topics that have been top of mind lately, there are all kinds of things that we want to do to make sure that our kids are physically and mentally healthy for going back to school. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out to your healthcare and public health providers with any questions or concerns that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradati, for that information and update. Uh, greatly appreciate it. A uh, few other introductions um, as well. Ms. Natalie Allen, she's a Chief Communications and Community Engagement uh, Officer. Dr. Kit Rogers, hi, Chief, sorry, Ms. Allen, Chief oh, Academic no, you're saying hi, everyone. <laughs> Officer. Um, and behind the scenes is uh, Mr. David Din. He's the Chief Information Officer as well. So we, um, we're gonna get into our questions here. We're gonna start with our uh, health update uh, questions. Uh, so the first question that uh, was submitted from families says, uh, can you give us updates about COVID and the mask policy? Uh, are they mandatory uh, at school or on the bus? And I believe this question, uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, you can answer this question for us. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. And uh, Dr. Pradati gave a good update of what the status was related to COVID. So I'll focus on the mask part. So masks are optional and uh, they are recommended when community level is medium or high. Currently we're in low. And if we get it to the medium or high category, our intention is to be able to, as part of our family communication, to be able to give a heads up for those who wanna to choose to uh, uh, mask up in those uh, areas. Um, also, they're recommended when you get to day six through 10 post positive tests uh, when you're on other people. And if you've been exposed, it's recommended that you wear a mask for 10 days following that exposure. Um, now, if a child is ill at school, that will be a time where they will be required to wear a mask. So for example, if they're ill at school, they go to the clinic and they're experiencing respiratory or COVID-like symptoms, uh, they'll be uh, given a mask to put a mask on until their parent comes to, to pick them up and take them there. Uh, so that's the, the update on where we are for masks for this year. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, I think I'm probably going to stay with you, sir. Um, what safety measures are in place re regarding trying to lessen the spread uh, both for COVID-19 and monkeypox? Yeah, so we continue our strong working relationship with the uh, Virginia Beach Department of Public Health, and we've developed, again, another layered mitigation strategy um, that is appropriate for where we are uh, related to COVID, and that includes self-screening, so uh, daily self-screening, stay at home if you're sick, vaccinations, uh, ventilation, including uh, our HVAC uh, maintenance. We have portable filters that are still in every classroom uh, and we'll continue to open windows when conditions permit to be able to increase airflow. Uh, we'll be practicing and reinforcing respiratory etiquette and uh, good hand hygiene. We're continuing with our uh, cleaning and disinfecting protocols uh, that we've been using. We have isolation rooms uh, for those who are sick with respiratory-like symptoms. 
Um, I just talked a little bit about what the masks uh, and how they contribute. Um, and finally, we'll notify families when we see clusters of cases in classrooms. So that'll be a difference uh, for this year as well as uh, Virginia Beach Department of Public Health is very much focused on the clusters of cases and we will communicate uh, when we see those. Uh, that was That's the COVID piece, but we're also paying attention to monkeypox as uh, you heard from Dr. Padati. And so step one is to continue to raise awareness about uh, monkeypox and uh, coordinate with Virginia Beach uh, Department of Public Health as those cases arise. Um, in addition to our routine disinfecting, we'll coordinate with Virginia Beach Department of Public Health if there's any deep disinfecting that's needed. Um, and we will also work with them on notifications that are required uh, for those that might to, uh, receive information about a case. Awesome. And Mr. Prima, you might have said this earlier, but is vaccinate, vaccination status required for, for students? So there are state mandated vaccines and that's based upon grade level. So for example, uh, Tdap is required for all students entering the seventh and eighth grade and uh, uh, meningococcal vaccine is required for seventh, eighth and 12th graders. Uh, and there's several vaccines that are required for students entering kindergarten. And you can see all those on the VDH immunization website. Awesome, thank you, sir. Um, the next question uh, that we have is, what is the plan for lunch? Uh, will students be eating in classrooms or cafeterias? Um, will there be a, a plan to distance students uh, when eating? Um, I think I'm gonna ask Ms. Colucci for her to respond to this question. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, toward the latter part of the school year last year, we returned to our pre-pandemic lunch procedures uh, with a focus on cleaning. And um, so we will uh, be inviting our students to resume that to open the school year again this year. And our custodial teams uh, will continue to work diligently to maintain um, our clean and healthy cafes. Um, and be present during lunch with other staff to ensure our students are appropriately seated and enjoying uh, each other's company while they have their meals. I'm sure the students will enjoy that because lunchtime is always a fun time in elementary school. Um, yes. And Mr. Freeman, I'm going to come back to you for this question. Uh, will parents be notified if a student is diagnosed with COVID in the same classroom as their child and as a child and had uh, uh, close contact. I'm sorry, excuse me. Yeah, so for this year, uh, like we mentioned earlier, we're focused on clusters of cases uh, that occur. So in the general education setting, if there are three cases or more that are in a classroom, a notification will be sent home to families. And in a special education setting, if it's one to two cases in that classroom, a uh, notification will be sent home. Awesome. And then one more for you, Mr. Freeman. Um, if a student is not feeling well, but has no fever, um, are they are they being allowed to uh, remain in the classroom? Well, so the, the context of that question is, uh, you know, there's the daily cell screening, uh, and parents should screen their children before they go to school. If the, if your child is sick, they should stay home uh, and get tested. Uh, if they're ill while they're at school, they should go see the nurse, and then the nurse will evaluate them and and take the appropriate action from there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is it has multiple parts, uh, so I'm going to read the first uh, part and have someone respond and then kind of work through it. Um, this is for either Mr. Freeman or Mr. Delaney. What is the process? Uh, what is the process parents should follow for this school year if we think a child has COVID? And I think you mentioned this just earlier, um, uh, Mr. Freeman, but if you could uh, restate that, I think it might be helpful. Yeah, so if, uh, if, if your child, if you think they're ill with COVID, they should stay home and get tested. And we have test kits that are available uh, at schools that they can uh, get from the school nurse and be able to, to test their child. Now, I'll, I'll go a little bit further and say that any child who tests positive or anybody who tests positive uh, will be required to isolate at home for five days. And that's from the onset of their symptoms um, or if they were asymptomatic from their test date. And that's regardless of vaccination status. Um, and they can return after day five if they're fever free without fever reducing medications and their symptoms are improving. Um, and to add on to that, what is the procedure if they think they have been exposed to COVID? Yeah, so in the past, and I think the, the reference to that is 
do you need to quarantine? And uh, quarantine is not a requirement uh, for this year. So if you believe that you've been exposed, quarantine is not required. Uh, they can continue to attend school so long as they remain asymptomatic, but please continue to screen. Um, and then consider for testing for COVID after five days. And again, those test kits are available at school. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, and the next part of the question um, is kind of a buildup, but if the child uh, has to miss school um, because of COVID, because of an exposure or even an illness, the question is what repercussions uh, will the child face uh, for missing classes? Mr. Delaney, I think I'm gonna throw this to you. Sure, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Alexander. In terms of students, it would be recorded if they're out ill with uh, due to the symptoms of COVID, they would be marked as uh, excused absent as long as their parent provided a note. Uh, teachers are always expected to provide makeup work to students so they stay as current as possible academically. If by chance that absence was to extend well beyond five days, uh, typically we would get the school counselors involved and the school administration and teachers involved to ensure that we put uh, supports in place for that student. Um, it's always important that, that parents uh, establish that, that communication with their school teacher, their administrator, and their school counselor. Thank you, Mr. Delaney. Um, we're gonna transition from uh, health uh, questions to safety questions. So Mr. Demartini um, will be providing some responses um, in regards to safety. Um, Mr. B Demartini, the first question is, what safety measures and preventive measures have been put in place to secure the school against outside intruders during the school day? And they've noticed, especially in the playground that, that is open to a park or a community rec center. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Uh, we have an expectation of all of our buildings that our exterior doors to be locked throughout the instructional day. Uh, and that uh, provides us a significant layer of protection from an intruder. Awesome. And um, how are lockdown drills handled? And they noted again, specifically for younger grades like kindergarten. So uh, the lockdown drills are uh, actually all drills are on a schedule that we follow uh, in accordance with the Virginia Education or the Virginia Education Educators Guide for planning and conducting school emergency drills. Uh, and we we conduct uh, fire drills, lockdown drills, uh, bus evacuation drills, earthquake earthquake drills, uh, and uh, we do that throughout the entire school year on a schedule. And if uh, Ms. Colucci wants to speak a little bit more about age specific drills, she, she can add a piece. Yes, yeah, so all of our teachers are trained in um, ensuring they deliver messages and um, teach routines and procedures in compliance with um, the guidance we receive from the state and the Office of Security and Emergency Management in an age appropriate way. So they're very sensitive and um, they're experts in doing that in a way everybody feels um, safe and it's very appropriately done. Awesome. Thank you both. And I, and I think it's very important too, as, as families are talking about these things with their children, is when you're doing these drills, take these drills seriously um, and you make sure to listen to their uh, teacher, administrators or other individuals in the building so that they remain uh, safe. Um, yes, and, and I would also add that we also communicate at the elementary school level in advance of a lockdown um, drill that takes place. So awesome. parents are informed. That's amazing. Thank you, Ms. Colucci. Um, next question, uh, Mr. Demartini. Uh, what additional security measures are being taken uh, to prevent all active shooters, an active shooter from entering the elementary school? Um, since there might not be a, a since there might or there isn't or might not be a fence or something to kind of stop them. Yes. Yeah, so in addition to locking our, our doors uh, throughout the instructional day, we also have a uh, buzzing system, which allows for our security staff to vet a visitor uh, at, our, at our entryway. Um, and that gives them an opportunity to um, assess the individual who's trying to visit our property. Uh, in addition to that, uh, all of our staff, uh, security staff, administration, uh, are able to put the building into uh, an ex exterior or interior lockdown. Uh, we also have uh, several ways to communicate lockdowns in our buildings. So we can um, do an all call, we can put it out over the radio, we can also uh, announce it verbally. Uh, 
communicated through a voice uh, mouth to voice mouth. So uh, we're prepared uh, to, in a layered system, to prevent someone from coming on our property to do us harm. And the last question I have for you, uh, Mr. Demartini, before we transition, um, can you speak to the policy on uh, or the expectation on doors being open? They shouldn't be open, but can you uh, at least inform the public on what that um, that expectation is? Yeah, it's an expectation of our of our buildings to have all doors uh, locked and closed at all times throughout the construct uh, instructional day. So the, the days of uh, propping doors open are, are over. Our doors should be uh, locked. Thank you. Mr. It's also it's also important to note that uh, when we have a, a scheduled lockdown drill, the communication goes out to our community uh, and notifies them of the drill. Thank you, and thank you for that information, Mr. Demartini. I know you have a uh, uh, daunting task in front of you, but we know we're in safe hands with your your team. So thank you for that information. All right, as we move on here, we're going to transition to. Um, cell phone and the, the cell phone policy. So Mr. Delaney, I believe uh, you're on the hot seat now for, for this. Um, so the first question that, that was submitted says, uh, was, with, um, with incidents happening in schools, um, parents are worried about students not having cell phones. Uh, how, is it keeping their, how is it that keeping their cell phones in a locker or bag um, a good thing? How is this a good thing? Yeah, and this certainly kind of follows what Mr. Demartini was just sharing about procedures and, you know, certainly want to acknowledge the, the anxiety that's out there amongst our families around coming to school and ensuring that their kids are safe. Uh, you know, as a former principal, there's always a goal to, to send them home as, as, as they arrived and that parents could give them a hug when they came back in the house safe and with a, a quality education. So we certainly understand that anxiety. Uh, what I think I, I'd like everybody to kind of recognize it's on this call is how comprehensive we are in trying to prepare for these scenarios. And uh, Mr. Demartini did some of that in his responses. And um, several parents or grandparents or community members on the call may have their own version of what drills used to look like when we were in school. And I think it's important for them to recognize that we have comprehensive emergency procedures in place for you know, the unthinkable, that we have to think of those things and be prepared for that. Um, one of those areas that we do not put in as, as a recommendation is students having widespread access to cell phones. Uh, we have strict communication protocols in place, strict procedures that we follow under the leadership of either senior staff or the building level principal or the first responders that are really, it's imperative that uh, we allow those people to do that work. I'd also reinforce it. Uh, Dr. Alexander, through you and Ms. Allen's office, we work very quickly to get communications out of the community to make them aware of what's going on and working with our local news, um, news uh, you know, locations and so forth to get that out to the community as well. I certainly understand the anxiety as a parent, wanting to make sure right away my child is safe and sound, but it also in some cases can, can cause a little bit of a security breach, whether it's by inhibiting the communication we can put out or maintaining um, a, a calm and collective school atmosphere as we respond to that uh, emergency. So uh, in, in summary of that end, certainly acknowledging the anxiety of the parent, but trying to ensure that they see that we have strict, really strong policies and procedures in place to, to respond to an emergency. Thank you, um, Mr. Lane. And, and you, you noted this in your response, but I'm, um, because it was submitted, I'm gonna ask uh, the question here. It says, you know, how are, how are our students or how are our children be able to contact the authorities if the unthinkable happens? Yeah, well, from an authority standpoint, we have every one of our teachers has communication in their classroom that they can call the main office to get the school resource officer. Uh, we have security assistance in the building as Mr. Demartini shared earlier. Um, teachers will be able to access a cell phone to call 911 in those severe situations. So uh, we certainly do not have the expectation that a student would be the one to contact authorities. Um, if it is a lockdown scenario, we want them hidden, safe, um, and, and not feeling like they need to respond. And uh, we have several mechanisms to do that. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to transition from cell phone to transportation. Uh, so Mr. Lash, you were up. Um, the first question is, will transportation be assigned, um, be assigned for my child before school begins? Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Um, 
for parents who fail to register their students um, for transportation services um, before the deadline, they have their students haven't been assigned to a bus stop. Um, only assigned students will be allowed to ride the buses to and from school. Um, students that registered after the deadline, however, will be assigned to a bus as quickly as possible. Uh, but bus service may be delayed, uh, and we anticipate um, processing students and getting them on buses as soon as possible. However, new registrations may take um, five to 10 business days to accomplish. Thank you. And the next question I have for you, uh, will there be a warning if the bus is, is not arriving um, at all or maybe even late? Okay, well, last year we, um, when we returned uh, from COVID, we understand that we had um, a lot of issues. We were trying to overcome a hundred plus driver deficit. Um, we were scrambling to make everything um, happen, get kids to and from school um, as, as soon as possible. So we did fail in that regard. Uh, however, as the school year progressed, we got better. Um, and we feel that this year, while it will be challenging at the beginning of the school year, uh, we are a better position to address those concerns and provide better quality of service this year. We do have a number of drivers we've hired over the summer and we have a number that will be coming on board shortly. So uh, we will be communicating better this school year. Thank you, Mr. Lass, appreciate that information. Sure. All right, so the, um, the next uh, set of questions are really just uh, general questions. Um, so any one of the panelists will, will be able to respond uh, to them. Um, the first question, uh, since we're coming back to general, I'm going to give to uh, Dr. Spence. Um, Dr. Spence, um, what a, a family member asked, <laughs> what more is being done uh, to incentivize teachers to stay? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. So uh, the, the good news is um, we really have an incredible team here in our human resources team working with our school leadership folks. And our school principals have, have done a really great job recruiting and bringing folks uh, to Virginia Beach. And so uh, we're feeling very confident with our teacher staffing as we head into this new school year. We still have some vacancies, but it is not nearly uh, at the level that we have seen in previous years uh, during the pandemic. And so we're, we're, uh, we're really pleased about that. We also know and recognize we want to keep our great teachers here in Virginia Beach, uh, just like most businesses out in the in the country right now. Folks have been leaving, um, wanting to try out other things, and you know probably heard about the Great Resignation, and certainly we were not immune to that. Um, but we know that it's really important that our great teachers stay in Virginia Beach. So the things that we have been doing, certainly focusing on compensation, making sure that. Our teachers are paid well and paid comparably to our peers. We're, in fact, in the middle of a compensation study where we hope to be able to share with our board uh, what it will take for us to remain competitive across all of our work groups. The other uh, functional reality, though, is that it isn't just compensation that keeps people here. It's a, it's a major issue, but there are other issues, um, including the culture of our organization and whether or not people feel really proud to work in their schools. And we have evidence that that people really do. Uh, but we also know sometimes that that isn't the case. And we uh, are certainly working to understand where we may have any challenges and, and supporting the leadership in those buildings to make sure that that uh, improves. But also, I think just in general, um, working to make sure that all of our teachers feel really valued, that they understand that, that we know them, really know who they are know what they need to be successful, that we see them and see them as the, the wonderful, amazing human beings that they are and that they know that they're loved and valued as professionals. And I would say to the parents on our call right now um, and the family members that are on our call, I would say, you know, one of the things we can do to keep our great teachers is for everybody out there to lift them up. They need to hear from you. They need to know uh, how much you appreciate the work that they do with your child and they need to hear from you and they need to hear gratitude. You know, um, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, all our teachers here are the parents who are upset with them and the ones who love what they're doing every day sometimes forget to call and just say, hey, thank you. I appreciate what you do. And I can tell you, having been a teacher, having been a school level leader, those small moments of gratitude are the things that mean the most to our teachers. And if we want them to stay, they need to hear from our community that they're appreciated and that they're loved. And uh, we also need as a community to lift them up as professionals that they are 
and ensure that uh, we recognize and that our community recognizes that they can be trusted and that they are an outstanding resource uh, for our community. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spence. Well said. Um, the next question um, is Ms. Harris. Um, and Vika Harris is the Director of Food and Distribution Services. Um, Ms. Harris, how can uh, somebody apply for free reduced meals? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. So we utilize a great school nutrition meal account platform called School Cafe, and that is available on our website. If you go to vbschools.com and click on student meals, you'll be able to see School Cafe tab on your left, and you could just click on there. It will take you directly to an application where it's a one-stop shop for everything cafeteria related, including applying for meal benefits. And once you sign up, which signing up is completely confidential, free, and it's very quick. Uh, once you sign up, you can apply for reduced price meals there, as well as you can also visit your child's school. They have paper applications where you can sign up their paper. We encourage parents to sign up online because we can process those applications within 24 to 48 hours. As you can understand, paper sometimes takes a little longer to get to us. Thank you. And I'm gonna stay with you, Ms. Harrison, for the next question as well. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the child's lunch, lunch account? Um, is there an auto pay option? And can families uh, have the option to exclude a child from buying uh, certain items? My daughter yes. was very upset by that, by the way. Definitely. So you may not want to listen to this part then, <laughs> not to upset your daughter, but definitely, as I mentioned, School Cafe is one, uh, one stop shop for everything. And so what you could do there is you can um, make purchase restrictions where uh, a parent can say, okay, my child it will not be able to purchase a la carte items on specific days of the week. Also, you can say uh, my child is only allowed to purchase a specific dollar amount um, of food a la carte items per week, um, or you know maybe only one item of a la carte per day. So that way your daughter is not purchasing cookies, you know, five per day. And so um, there is definitely um, the option there to restrict meals. There is also an option to do an auto pay for payments on that particular platform. So once you go into the platform, there is a dashboard for payments. You can sign up with a credit card, a debit card, even with a check number. So the EFT will come out of your bank account um, and it will be uh, set up for auto pay if you choose the auto pay option. That way parents don't have to worry about if the meal account gets low in value and you know, someone like your daughter can still continue to get a la carte items. You can definitely exclude your child from buying specific items as well. And so if there is any specific requests, you can always, always please call us or talk to your cafeteria manager at your school. Great. Thank you. There you go. No more chocolate chip cookies. Over. <laughs> so, all right. So moving to the uh, next question. Thank you, Ms. Harrison, for that information. Um, Mr. Delaney, uh, next question is for you. Will after school clubs and activities resume at the elementary level this year? Yeah, actually, they resume towards the end of the 21 22 school year. So we highly encourage students get involved in those activities and clubs. Um, we have a strategic uh, goal around student well being, and we find these extracurricular activities, these clubs, really help students become more balanced personally, socially responsible, interacting with their peers. Um, so highly, highly recommend uh, that students get involved. We see a relationship between their uh, you know, getting involved in after school activities and their academic performance in the school. So uh, certainly reach out to their teacher and others in the school and, and, and let's get them involved in those. It's a great opportunity for them to really engage in the school community. Uh, absolutely. Um, and you have the next question as, as well. Um, and this is a little bit more specific, but uh, they're giving an example of their ninth grader uh, was scheduled to take uh, four core classes, uh, which are four by fours um, in one semester. The other semester is all electives. She was wondering, he or she was wondering, shouldn't, shouldn't there be a mechanism in place to uh, balance out the workload, especially for a freshman? 
And can parents request their schedule uh, to be changed so they can be successful and not be overwhelmed? Yeah, so I would say the mechanism is their school counselor. That's the first place to kind of go to to ensure that they're really reviewing and balancing that schedule. Uh, for those on the call, I know this is an elementary school call, but this will be helpful to all. The high school schedule adjusted this year. Um, it's more of what we're calling a flexible schedule. So to the parent who submitted that question, I think it's a great opportunity to engage with their school counselor and ask that exact question that they asked. It's a very good question. And uh, we always expect our parents to advocate for their kids, whether it's the classes they're taking or how they've been assigned. So I think the first step would be to reach out to that school counselor um, and if they uh, need more information, they would then move on to the administration. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harrison, I'm coming back to you. Um, it's a food services question again. Um, how do you sign up and get your, your child's number to register? Um, that's the first part of the question. The other part is um, how, how does a child understand what to get and how much food to get? And then I'll break down the other parts of the question. Sounds good. So to get your student's personal identification number, or we call it the PIN, you can either talk to your school's data clerk, the administration, or you can even call our office and we can look up the student in our system. Uh, we can be uh, called at 263-1101, or you can email us at vbfoods at vbschools.com. And we can provide that PIN number for you. Um, if you need to sign up, you will need to have that PIN number in order to add a student to your meal account in School Cafe. So now the other question you had deals with how does a child know how much food to get? And so we have a lot of very qualified school nutrition professionals that work in our cafeterias. And we have we advised students on what is there on the line for them to receive. We operate a federal United States Department of Agriculture program. And so there are specific meal components that the child should take as part of their breakfast and lunch. And so your child doesn't have to worry about what to get. Our team will guide them through the lunch line and um, let them know what is there that's available for them to pick. Awesome. Um, and then the other parts of this, can they can they bring their own lunch? Um, and is the school using Seesaw or, or Parent View or the VB Schools website uh, for communication? So yes, we definitely um, encourage parents and students to visit us in the cafeterias. Our food um, will be great this year. We're serving scratch menu items at all the schools. But however, I know that some parents uh, and some kids want to show off those uh, lunch boxes that they just purchased over the summer. And so they're definitely welcome to bring their own lunch and eat at the, in the cafeterias with their friends. And uh, as far as communication, we use the BBCPS website to communicate um, any changes in food service operations. We use uh, Parent Square, which is also an alert now type system to send out messages to families. And a lot of communication is actually listed on the dashboard in School Cafe. So you can see menus there and you can see any updates to our operations on that platform as well. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Um, next question is about uh, Parent Square. Ms. Allen, you are now up. Um, is Parent Square, Square a new platform that students will be using uh, for their schoolwork, et cetera? Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button for a second there. So Parent Square is uh, VBCPS's new Alert Now communication platform. Um, it replaced School Messenger and it allows parents and guardians uh, to receive all of their communications from the district and their schools in one unified app. And parents will be able to keep track of news activities and events from all their children's schools in one place. Um, and obviously we know that effective school to home communication has never been more important. So we're hoping that uh, Parent Square makes that really easy for everybody. Awesome. Very excited for the new platform. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Din, there is a question for you, sir. Um, does a school provide Chromebooks to new students or is that something parents need to purchase before school begins? 
No, Virginia Beach City Public Schools definitely provides Chromebooks to each and every single student. And we are happy to um, uh, make sure that every student is gonna have one. So as soon as they enter in the uh, school of their choice, then, uh, well, sorry, the school, their home school, they will be assigned a Chromebook uh, prior to, uh, well, within the first week of school. Awesome, thank you. All right. Um, Sorry, I lost my thought here. Uh, Mr. Delaney, coming right back to you. You're on the hot seat here, buddy. Um, my child is a transfer student from a private uh, school uh, to first grade. Um, at the old school, we knew staff, parents, teachers, um, and it was a great community. Uh, now we enter a new city and new public school. What types of events, like community building events, uh, does the school host so parents meet other people? Well, first and foremost, welcome to uh, Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We're, we're excited you've uh, enrolled in our, our amazing schools. Dr. Alexander is the Director of Family and Community <laughs> Engagement. You might uh, you know, judge me on this answer, but obviously that shows our commitment to mutually supported partnerships in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Elementary schools cannot function uh, without building close communities. Parent involvement, community involvement is essential, whether it's a, a book fair, a bingo night, the fall fair, uh, so many events at skating parties, the list goes on and on. And I think um, a great place to start off in is to join the PTA and, and get involved that way and recognize all that they have to offer there. Our schools are always looking for volunteers to come into the schools and assist with a variety of projects that are going on. Um, I think you will find the opportunity to really feel a part of your, of your elementary school is right there for you to embrace. And again, I wanna welcome you to Virginia Beach City Public Schools. It's a great place to educate your kids and uh, hopefully you'll get involved with, it, with your school in the manner that meets the needs of your question there. And again, I'd just like to emphasize the work that Dr. Alexander's team does on family and community engagement. They work very closely with schools to ensure that they're doing the appropriate outreach. Thank you, Mr. Delaney, and I agree with all that. Definitely reach out to your school, um, look for opportunities, um, um, and you know, take some risk as well. Maybe uh, you know, as Mr. Delaney said, the the PTA, but there's also a lot of opportunities for schools that you can uh, take advantage of. So um, please reach out uh, to the school, and they'll definitely help you out. Um, and the last question, uh, Mr. Din, I'm going to uh, give to you, sir. Um, is there a list of all the apps that pertain to the school uh, for the alerts, communication, uh, bus tracking, student information that parents are expected to have, um, such as Parent View, Parent Square, EduLog, Parent Portal, VBCS apps, et cetera? You know, we have a comprehensive list of applications uh, that are in use throughout the division. Um, however, each and every single school, depending on the level of your student, may choose. Uh, the apps that they use in particular a little bit uh, differently or specific to them. And so the best place to get that uh, information is definitely from the teachers of your students. Thank you, Mr. Din. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for your time uh, today as panelists. Thank you all for uh, viewing uh, the session today. That concludes our session tonight. As a reminder, this session will be recorded and can be found on VB School's website. Thank you again, panelists, for your time and expertise, and thank you all for viewing uh, tonight's session. We look forward to seeing you next, seeing you this year. Make it a fantastic school year. We are really excited uh, to have all the students uh, in school this year, and it's going to be a great year, as Dr. Spence said. With that being said, be safe and have a great night. Thank you all very much for joining us.